Um, I think we've really heard a lot of common themes today, um, a lot surrounding things like identity and storytelling and sharing those stories. Um, recently, it was said that one of the best ways for us to um, create compassion between one another and to pr promote understanding between individuals is through storytelling, our ability to tell our stories, as well as our ability to um, listen to the stories of others. And hopefully you guys have really been able to engage in that today. So this afternoon, I would like to talk about uh, Canadian diversity um, and take it on, on a bigger level as well as um, on a smaller level here on campus. And so my talk is entitled Broken Mosaic, and I would really like to uh, challenge some of the perceptions, some of the ideas that we have surrounding diversity. So I'll tell you a little bit about my story so that you can get an understanding of where I'm coming from. So before I came to Vancouver, um, I did my commerce degree in Calgary. Uh, it seems like we've got a few of us in the crowd. And before Calgary, I was actually born in Edmonton. So I am definitely a born and raised Alberta girl. Now, I was actually born to two immigrant parents who both hail from Kenya, who now hopefully you guys can uh, look on a map and know where that is. Thank you, Iris. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, my parents had grandparents who hailed from a northern province in India uh, called Gujarat and a small area in there called Kutch. And so what I think these really show is just how many... Um, identities that I find resonate within me. Now, these four are actually just a part of a plethora of other identities that I find resonate within myself. And I think what this really speaks to is just how diverse we are as individuals. And because of that diversity, I think it's really important to start to question then why it is that we so easily group people of the same culture, race, nationality, or ethnicity together as one group who talk the same, who behave the same, and who think the same way. And so I think this really should begin to start to create a shift in the way that we think. Now today, like I said, I want to talk to you about diversity, but I also want to talk to you about discourse and just how important these elements are in fostering and sustaining um, the multicultural society that we really want to develop in Canada. Now, I want to address things like how it is we've come to think the way that we do about others and how that manifests, manifests in our behaviors and start to look at things like the Canadian culture uh, mosaic model. And I'd like to suggest you perhaps another way within which we can deal with diversity. So, Canada is often seen as this beacon of multicultural and multi-religious coexistence, where everyone lives together with mutual respect. In fact, leaders such as His Highness the Aga Khan, who is the uh, spiritual leader of Ismaili Muslims, as well as people like the Dalai Lama, have seen Canada as a place promoting this um, respect for human dignity, as well as human harmony. So clearly, Canada has this reputation of really succeeding in diversity. But how true is this reputation, and how well has it really embodied these qualities? Well, I would like to suggest to you that perhaps Canada hasn't necessarily lived up to this reputation. And these headlines, which I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with the uh, news events, really illustrate just how much work is yet to be done in Canada. Now, I'd like for us to just take a, a moment and start to think about um, some of the perceptions we have and how we've come to these perceptions. Now, I was recently reintroduced to the concept of Newton's first law of motion, and by the show of hands earlier, I know that there are a lot of scientists in the crowd, so I, I apologize for the oversimplistic version of this, but Newton's first law of motion states that an object in motion stays in motion in the same direction at the same speed unless another force is acted upon it. Now I got to thinking, perhaps our minds actually work in a very similar fashion. So what do I mean by this? Well, when we learn something, we understand it to be true unless otherwise told. Now this can happen in a formal setting, such as work or at school, or it can happen in an informal setting, such as through the media or through pop culture or even through talking with friends. 
And so what, mean, what this means then is that sources of information, which may be laced with things like sensationalism or personal opinion, are suddenly taken as sources of truth. And it's here that our assumptions and our perceptions of different communities is really formed. So what's happening? How is that translating into behavior? Well, I think what's really going on in a lot of countries like Canada that are facing issues of diversity and immigration is we have this issue of people feeling threatened and there's fear. So what happens when we feel threatened? Well, either people are going to fight or they will flee. Who's feeling threatened and why? Well, what's going on is we have communities such as immigrants or people um, from visible minority groups who are feeling threatened in that their ways of living, that their beliefs and their values are suddenly being questioned and objectified and stigmatized without necessarily a full understanding of what those beliefs entail. And similarly, we have individuals from the mainstream society feeling stifled and suffocated in their ability to, to express themselves on this constantly changing dynamic of culture within Canada because of heightened sensitivity around political correctness. So what's happening? People are either fighting or fleeing. And by fighting, I mean people are retaliating through acts of discrimination, as were outlined in some of those headlines I showed you, or they're acting in ways of things like hate crime, vandalism. Now on the other hand, you also have people who are starting to flee. And what do I mean by that? Well, people are starting to absolve themselves of the issue, saying discrimination doesn't exist in Canada. And what they're doing is they're trying to keep the peace. So what happens when people try to keep the peace? Well, what they don't realize is keeping the peace also means keeping the silence. And what happens when we keep the silence about misperceptions and misconceptions of communities in our society? Well we have the resulting um, effects of things like racial profiling, like ethnic cleansing. Or we have much more larger scale historical events that have really marked human society, such as things like the Holocaust. Or we have things that continue to exist today, like native reserves. And so as you can see, much of this is very much a part of our past and it continues to be our reality. And unless these issues are addressed, they will remain in our future. So, Canada and diversity. I'm sure many of you here are very familiar with our concept of the mosaic model. Now, Canadians often pride themselves on this model because it's very much supposed to be the antithesis, antithesis sorry, of the American naturalizing uh, cauldron, if you will where people are respected for their differences. Well, I would actually like to suggest that this is actually a bit of a problematic model. Now, why is that? Well, what is a mosaic? A mosaic is a whole image that is comprised of individual pieces coming together. And in this case, these pieces are actually communities. Now, what happens in a mosaic is that despite this whole image, these communities are actually left in isolated pockets. And these isolated pockets then create cultural ghettoization. And this ghettoization then manifests itself physically into different communities. Now, to the left, I have three communities that are in and around the greater Vancouver area. And on the right, I have three images that are most likely to be used to represent these uh, communities. So what I would like for all of you to do in your mind is to match up the images on the right with the communities on the left. Now, I'm going to match them up and we'll see just how well the answers on the screen have matched up with your own images. So, just by a way of hands, who here achieved the same result as that on the screen? Okay. Now, I think that really speaks to the fact that we're able to take one identity and match it up with an entire city an entire community that is made up of so many other individuals. Why are we so quick to do that? Why are we so quick to summarize an entire community within one image, one behavior, one race? Now, this concept of stereotyping, of grouping together, is really uh, summed up well 
A woman by the name of Naomi Lockritz is actually a reporter for the Calgary Herald. Now, she describes Canadian multiculturalism as the practice of watching peasant skirts swirling at an ethnic festival while we snack on exotic foods, all the while congratulating ourselves on how tolerant we are because these communities are behaving the way we want them to. Now, that doesn't exactly sound like multiculturalism. Naomi touches on a very interesting aspect of what we know today as multiculturalism, and that is the term of tolerance. So often we're told, be tolerant to one another, understand one another. We coexist because we tolerate. Well, according to Gandhi, tolerance is the gratuitous assumption of the inferiority of another person's faith and value. Now, what I believe this says then is that tolerance is not necessarily rooted in multiculturalism, but that of ethnocentrism. And what that creates then is an implicit hierarchy within our multiculturalism. So I would like to suggest that instead of a model of tolerance for our diversity, we instead focus one based on discourse. And so what does that mean? Well, I see discourse as being that, for, that force that I referenced before in terms of Newton's first law of motion. That discourse becomes that force to change our trajectory in terms of how we are perceiving diversity as it is right now. It's about not labeling anymore and about understanding. So I suggest a new diversity where we go past the community where we go to the individual, where we see the diversity within the individual themselves. It's about not just the person and the community that they represent anymore. It's about what that individual represents within themselves. It's about putting diversity on a much more humanistic level. So diversity, tolerance, discourse, it sounds good, but it's still a little bit abstract. So let's bring it down to a bit more tangible level. Now, I feel like this image has been repeated so many times over, but I think it really speaks to what's happening in our own backyard. Currently, UBC is formulating its own diversity and equity policy. And it really resonates into the fact of how the university recognizes um, the very concepts that we've been discussing, and that is recognizing the potential that lies within our differences and really results, as you can see, in the ability to create a robust and collegial environment. And I think that's really what it's about, is really creating a lot more meaning in our university careers through engaging with one another and being able to appreciate those differences that manifest between ourselves. And so it is from this quote that I decided I was going to formulate my own Terry Talks wish for this year. And that is the creation of an interfaith, interracial, and intercultural community on campus. Now I know that sounds quite broad, so what does this community entail? Well, first and foremost, I see this community as being a safe place. We've seen today just the different shapes and forms that identity can take within us. And to address these issues is a ver very personal experience. And so I see this place as being a place where students feel supported um, and welcome to talk about these issues. Second, the heart of this kind of community lies within the students themselves to mobilize. And so what I see is the cross-cultural collaboration of clubs on campus. This isn't about creating another club creating another council that is totally disengaged with its own mission and the students it's supposed to represent. Rather, this is about students coming together and initiating collaboration themselves. So what do I see? I see things where students are collaborating on things that perhaps never seemed possible before. For example, I see things like Islamic Awareness Week coming together during the same time as Israel Awareness Week. I see things like Chinese students coming together and Indian students coming together and addressing issues of gang violence. You know, so often, even though we're so lucky to go to these awareness weeks on campus, you'll walk through sub and you'll find that the very students going to these booths are the students from the community themselves. 
You're preaching to the choir. And so where is that collaboration? Where is that cultural enrichment and promotion and diversity that these clubs work so hard to promote? So how do we facilitate some of that dialogue? Well, it's about welcoming that cross-cultural awareness. It's about deciding on initiatives that help both uh, students themselves and clubs um, to work on these things together. And so why am I addressing clubs? Well, of UBC's over 200 largest clubs on campus, over 30 of them are either culturally affiliated, religiously affiliated, um, based on some kind of ethnicity or nationality, and I'm sure many of you here are actually affiliated with those clubs. It's amazing the things that you learn if you read those AMS agenda books. Um, <laughs> now, I really feel that this is something important, but it's not unique to UBC. And so I see the success of such a community spreading across to other major universities uh, across Canada. And it's also about realizing that this global community that we have on our campus is connected to a very larger community um, around the world and being able to create those connections. And last, although there's so many different avenues, as we saw with um, Jeff's initial uh, project last year, there's so many different things that can happen with these initiatives. One thing that is really dear to me and that I think will really be important in sustaining such a community will be university students going off campus. As university students, we are role models for students that are up and coming, children and youth. And it's about us solving the issues of diversity and taking those tools to students in elementary schools and junior highs and high schools and telling them that yes, it is possible for us to live within one another um, despite our differences and actually using those differences to create something even bigger. At those ages, our own identities and creating the identities and forming identities of others is really uh, crucial at that time. And so by us going off campus and really educating students, um, I think will really be elemental in the success of this. So, whether or not you decide to contact um, this email address or decide to contact Terry through Twitter or Facebook um, or through their Gmail account, hopefully something I've said today resonates with you and you decide to mobilize on this. Whether it's the idea that students can come together and make something big, whether it's the fact that you are involved in a club and this is something that you feel has been needed Despite clubs wanting to come together and collaborate with one another, that forum just isn't there. And so perhaps this community will, will uh, address that, that gap. Now, I want to close off by leaving you with one last question. And I know you've been posed many, many questions today, many challenges. But what I do want to just leave you with is what is your takeaway today? What idea, what concept, what dream, what experience has resonated with you today? Whether it's in my talk or the multitude of other speeches you've heard, what is it that you are going to decide to take with you and do something about? And so I hope that today has really touched you in some way in some shape, in some form, to decide to address something that you've been wanting to deal with and something that you want to improve, whether in your life or the lives of others. And so I want to thank you all for coming out today. I see so much power in all of you that I can't wait to see what we can all do together. Thank you. Thank you.